All right, this is Clawhammer Mike. Welcome to the Upper Midwest Old Time Listening Party. Um, that's usually what it is. Tonight's a very special edition. It's going to be the Midwest Old Timey Listening Party. You can see down down here that uh, that's that's what I'm changing the name to for tonight's special episode. So um, hopefully uh, we've got a bunch of new listeners. Usually what happens is, you know, we listen to a bunch of shottishes, polkas, waltzes, all that kind of good stuff, all that good uh, Norwegian-American, Scandinavian-American stuff, but we also throw in all the different music from the upper Midwest. We throw in the German stuff and the different uh, Eastern Bloc stuff that, you know, happened here. Basically, we look at all of the old music from old traditional music to the upper Midwest. But my curiosity is down the bed of me so tonight we're going down river and uh, down the old Mississippi for us and then uh, we're gonna spread out east and west by the time we get down to the Missouri region so um, yeah it's I've, I put in a, I put in a bunch of work for this show um, if you want to tip it all my tip my tipping is up there in the corner. My PayPal is unarmedjournal at hotmail.com and my Venmo is at clawhammermike. But I hope you guys enjoy this episode. I, I really enjoyed making it. I got to talk with all these wonderful, great folks who you'll find out about here in a minute. You know, if, if, you're, if you're watching from down in, you know, down in the south, down in the Midwest, you know, you'll know these folks already. But I know a lot of my, my, a lot of my viewers, this will be the first time seeing a bunch of these folks. So, first of all, we're going to go, just starting right off here, we're going to go travel to, uh, well, we were going to travel to Chicago, but we're not going to travel to Chicago. Chicago. We're going to go down to Hallsville, Missouri, which is where um, Charlie Walden was originally fun. Charlie Walden really needs no introduction. He's a he's a great old timey fiddler, and uh, we're gonna we're gonna get into the interview right now. All right, this is Clawhammer Mike with Charlie Walden here. Charlie really needs no introduction, according to Midwest Fiddling. He's he knows it all. He probably knows more <laughs> tunes than uh, he probably forgotten more tunes than I've ever known so uh he knows everything I ever knew you know that <laughs> <laughs> so he knows he knows everything from Missouri Valley stuff up to Ottawa Valley he know he knows it all and parts in between so uh Charlie what what originally got you into music at a young age ah uh, well you know I was a bored teenager so mm. and and at one point I had a choice this uh, bifurcation could have occurred my English Junior high English teacher had a violin for sale. The guy who lived up the street, there were these two kind of like, shall I say, hippie guys who lived in this old rundown house there in Hallsville, Missouri, where I grew up. One of them had a pedal steel guitar he wanted to sell. And they were both $75. So I wonder how my life would be different if I had bought the pedal steel guitar instead of the violin. <laughs> but I bought the violin. Thank goodness he did, man. Those electric guitars, you got to put them away. Got to keep the fiddles out. Put the electric guitars away. Right, yeah, I'd be playing like, you know, Herb Remington stuff now instead of Pete uh, Max. When I started, when I started wanting to play, there were just so many guys around mid-Missouri there who played fiddle. Uh, it was just, it was pretty ubiquitous, you know. It was like, you couldn't go to anything like a church social or a county fair or whatever where you'd always, you'd always hear somebody playing fiddle. It was really everywhere. Once you once you hooked onto it, you realized that fiddle was being played all over the place in central Missouri there where I grew up. So it was, you know, and I just liked the music because I I always liked the music from cartoons. And like fiddle music is really a lot of it is kind of cartoon music in a way, you know, it's from that sort of era, you know, of the late eighteen hundreds. I, I don't know why cartoons used so much fiddle music. I think probably because there was no copyright, you know. So yeah, that that's sort of what got hooked. It hooked my ear, you know, that way. So why is the Midwest fiddling tradition important to you? Oh well, it's the stuff I grew up hearing, you know, and I just I like it because it's so melodic. It's it's uh, I like the very distinct melody and the nice fat round notes, you know, and uh, yeah, and and it's just it's complex, you know. Some of the fiddle old fiddle tunes, you know, because I really gravitate toward the the Victorian era fiddle music that's in all those old books from the 1800s. That's my favorite era of music. And that stuff is like, was all over the Missouri repertoire. The Iowa repertoire was loaded with those Victorian era fiddle tunes from, you know, Cole's 1000 fiddle tunes, which was previously Ryan's mammoth collection, I think. And uh, 
yeah, so I just really liked that music because it was is melodically interesting, melodically complex. But at the same time, you know, it's hopelessly repetitive, like all good fiddle music. So I liked it from that uh, aspect as well. Very, very naughty, obviously. The very, very naughty, obviously. The Midwest, yeah, yeah. Midwest stuff is. You have to be very technically precise to uh, play it. Um, and how would you differentiate it from the rest of the country's fiddling traditions? Would you say it's just a lot less emphasis on the bow per se? I don't know. You probably know who Reese Jones is, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Reese. I live in Chicago now, of course, and and Reese was from here and. I played around him quite a bit and we knew each other well when he was living here. So we, we were in the line at Clifftop one year, just a couple of years ago, when you're waiting in line to get in, you know, and uh, he was down, I was listening to him down the way, he was a few campers behind us and he was showing some young woman to play a tune. And uh, I, I saw, I was just kind of watching from a distance and I saw all this bow movement, but very few notes coming out. <laughs> And and I think that's the one of the big distinguishing things, you know, because the, the up the music from the upland south or what I'd call the eastern festival style play is really heavily interested in, uh, you know, the, the the right hand is really important. Not that it's not important in in midwestern music, but you know, the fit there might seem not much finger movement, but a whole heck of a lot going on with the right hand shuffles and string crossings back and forth to get that effect that they get with that music and i can't play that style at all i'm totally skint when it comes to playing that but uh, whereas you know the midwestern stuff is driven by the melody drives the tune you know it's it's very much about a lot happening on the left hand mm -hmm. and so to me that's like the big difference in those two styles you know? and then i think you know like the texas stuff is closer to the Missouri stuff than it is to the Appalachian stuff. Yeah, so, you know, those are three big strains, I think, that in the country. And so, you know, the, the Missouri Midwestern stuff is much closer uh, in uh, philosophy than uh, with Texas style stuff than it is, say, with Upland South style music, I think. Yeah, I think you've described that well from what from what I know. Um, now, Nick, talk about a few of your big inspirations uh, when you when you're growing up. Who are who are the best? Who are the favorite of your fiddlers, and and what made them your favorite? Did you have any personal connections with them? Sure. Yeah. Well, you know, when I was I, I grew up in this little town called Hallsville, which is in Boone County, right in central Missouri. It's north of Columbia, about 15 miles, and my the woman who taught home economics at our little school, and it was a small school, rural school, uh, her name was Betty White. And her husband was John White, who a lot of people know who John is. Uh, Voyager Records did a CD of him. He passed away a couple of years ago now uh, in his 80s, but he was a really fine fiddler. And actually he was really the first fiddler I heard play. And it was at a school event. I think she had roped him into playing for some kind of fundraising thing at the school, you know, like maybe an ice cream social or something. And uh, back when people had ice cream socials. But, uh, so, he, and he's the one who, he, I asked him about learning to play. I think that's when I first kind of got interested and then went out looking for a, a fiddle because I just thought it sounded really cool. And, but he took, sent me to Taylor McBain. Either I was, he didn't want to teach or I was particularly, particularly annoying, but whatever reason, as a teenager, he sent me to Taylor McBain in Columbia, and Taylor's really the person who taught me how to play initially. And I would just go hang at his house. And then when I got a little older and would, could drive, you know, I turned 16, I would, then I started visiting Pete McMahon, and I drove all over the Ozarks, and played with Bob Holt and Art Galbraith. I could drive to Pete McMahon's house. He lived about 20 miles west of me. And Pete was like, you know, this nationally known old time fiddler, played in contests, but he played his his version of Missouri style fiddle in these big contests against players that were playing, you know, what I'd call contest style fiddle. And he could hold his own because he had such a unique sound. And I learned a ton of stuff from him. And then I met Cyril Stennett at a fiddle contest and decided, okay, I better go see him too. And he's, you know, a really great fiddle player and he, he won the contest at Weezer one year. Uh, so so he, he was an incredible player, but this would have been in the early 60s when he won. 
So I learned a ton and ton of stuff from him and from Dwight Lamb and from Dwight Lamb sharing all of his uh, reels of Bob Walters music with me and uh, my friend Bill Schull, who was, we both kind of were running the Missouri Fiddlers Association at the time. So yeah, it, it, those, those, I guess, Cyril, Pete and uh, Taylor McBain were probably my biggest influences. But then I really liked and learned a lot from some of those Ozark players as well. And for those of you who don't know, on this show, we go back and we, we talk to the modern folks, but we also go back and we listen to the old stuff. And so that's what we're going to do right now. Um, every fiddler who we talk to tonight pulls out a bunch of different names of people who we could uh, talk about or play music of. And uh, we're not going to get to all of them tonight because our show's already pretty jam-packed as it is. But uh, we, can't, we can't have a show about Midwest fiddling without uh, playing the great Cyril Stinnett. Cyril was uh, one that... Uh, Charlie just talked about here, and he's he's universally recognized as one of the best of the Midwest fiddlers. So we don't want to listen to Cyril now. Called what? Joseph one the coated fiddle. Joseph one the coated fiddle. Yeah. Hey. Yeah, the great Cyril Stinnett, you can listen to that fellow all day. Um, in the chat, they're pointing out a couple different things which are true. Um, one is there's a portable pump organ behind, and boy, that's that's uh, really unique to uh, Midwest old time. Uh, maybe not unique, but it's 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 very pr prevalent, you know, that uh, a, lot of, a lot of that portable pump organ, it's called like a, uh, a pastor's organ because he'll bring it around. You can bring it around everywhere, you know. Um, when we're out at the Minnesota Bluegrass Festival, some Somebody will bring out this old, you know, portable pump organ and be playing along. It sounds, it sounds great with the music. You know, if you got Midwest music, the pump organ goes along great with it. They also pointed out that Cyril Stinnett was a lefty, which uh, there are so many left-handed Midwest fiddlers. It's 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 an amazing thing. You know, uh, a lot of elite left-handed Midwest fiddlers. Anyways, moving on, we got Charlie back talking to us about part two, and eventually he's gonna get into the tune he's gonna play for us today because that's what we do on the show. We talk about music. And then the fellers who we talked about and the women play play tunes. So uh, that's what's that's what's coming up here. How many like Midwest tunes do you think you know? Uh, maybe five hundred or something like that. Probably I bet. That's that are played. Not all of them are Midwest origin, but the tunes that were in that repertoire when I was growing up. Yeah. Uh huh. There were, there were a lot of tunes floating around. It was just, and I'd love go meeting. I love going to meet other people who I hadn't run into. Because they'd play like like Niall Wilson. I don't know if you heard of him, but uh, no. Uh, oh yeah, he was a really great fiddler from up in uh, north of Columbia, there, kind of north central Missouri. You know, you we went to see him, and he played like thirty tunes that we'd never heard, like good tunes. You know, you could always go to somebody, 
some some as uh, as the Harrisons used to call them boinkers, you know, the old guys who played. Uh, you'd always get a, an odd tune or two that maybe wasn't was okay, not so good. This guy played like you know thirty fabulous tunes for us in a row. That and eventually, actually, we put out a CD of his playing in the nineties because he was so good, so unique. But so yeah, there were always these gems guys you'd run into who could play a ton of good tunes that you grow on. Wow, how did I miss? How did I miss these tunes? You know. I know it's tough to just pick a tune and out of out of all the ones you know, but which one do you want to zero in on today? You know, I think the tune I have most fun playing is something called Zach Wheat's piece, which is actually a tune that was resurrected by R.P. Christensen. I was lucky to have a nice association with him, you know, who wrote those two Missouri mm-hmm. tune books that were published in the 70s. And uh, that was a tune he recalled from memory uh, that we didn't hear anybody playing at the time, but it's a great little hoedown in D. I think I think I have as much fun playing that tune as any other. Zach Wheat's piece. Bob took a lot of those tunes from memory because the guys he'd learned it from were long dead and he could never have recorded them. There wasn't the technology. But anyway, it was from down in that kind of Lake of the Ozarks area of the Ozarks, you know, North Central Ozark area. So uh, thanks for hanging out with us today. Um, sure, let's man. let's talk about uh, where we can find your stuff, you know, where we can find your CDs, what you want to promote, what you want us to know about. Okay, well, that's easy, you know. I've, I've since, the, since the, uh, the, t- the troubles have started, I've been streaming like mad on YouTube. And so I'm actually going to send you a couple of things. I'm going to send you this at Big Fiddle Show sticker. And what all people have to do is go into their browser and type in at Big Fiddle Show, and up will come the entire Big Fiddle Show media empire will be available for on view. And so there's like, I've got a blog, I've got, you know, Twitter feed, an Instagram, uh, there's a Facebook fans page for the Big Fiddle Show, but the Big Fiddle Show itself is a once weekly, and previously before the summer, is twice weekly, just v- fiddle variety show, for lack of a better term. And then the other thing I'm doing is, uh, something called Camp Possum. And if you'll notice, our motto is no pants, no problem. <laughs> that means that I'm doing a lot of teaching now on YouTube. It's all free. Again, it's on the same, my YouTube channel, Charlie Walden. Just type in Charlie Walden Fiddle. And uh, so I've got uh, a Fiddle for Duffers class. I've got uh, Mandolin for Duffers. I've got Guitar for Duffers, uh, each a different day of the week. And also we have a northern jam session where we play upper Midwest and Canadian tunes only. That's on Wednesday nights. And uh, then I then I have Camp Possum Proper, I call it, which is the, a Saturday morning where I also teach a tune, a little more advanced tune on Saturday mornings. It's all there. Just type in at Big Fiddle Show or Camp Possum and you'll find everything that's going on. So it's that's a lot of fun. Great. That's great. I've seen the Big Fiddle Show. It's great. I just didn't know that you were doing all these other things. It's amazing. COVID <laughs> isn't slowing you down, none. I can no, see. no. <laughs> it's, you know, I feel like, you know, you got to do your part to keep people entertained, you know, keep them engaged. So Yes, and you're doing great. So thanks, Charlie, for hanging out sure, with man. us today and t- teaching us all the great history about Midwest fiddling. All right. Take her easy. All right. Bye-bye. What well, say there, Clawhammer Mike? This is Charlie, the Possum Walden. Hey, I really enjoyed being on your program, the Upper Midwest Old Time Listening Party. It was great fun. You know, you're one of the best celebrity interviewers I've encountered since Robin Leach, who used to do that Lifestyles of the Rich and Famous. You made me feel like the Crown Prince of Brunei or something. Man, hit me with them hard questions, though, too. Hey, you know, we talked about Zach Wheat's piece, one of those Missouri tunes. I'm going to give you a little taste of it right now. Here we go. Thank you. 
Thanks, buddy. See you down the road somewhere. All right, that was Charlie. He was great. Great to interview. Uh, next, we're going to go up down to Lawrence Canvas there. You can see my little Honda Fit going there from Hallsville to Lawrence. We're going to go talk to Trisha Spencer here. Trisha's a great one to talk to. She's, um, she's, you know, she plays her grandpa's tunes, which is what we really value on this show. If you, if you listen to my show, The Upper Midwest Listening Party, you know that that's a lot of the work that, uh, I really value is that, um, multi-generational, you know, tune sharing. And uh, this is this is one of those cases. I love this interview, and I and I she she is one of my favorite fiddlers, absolutely for sure. Trisha Spencer here in Lawrence. All right, so it's Clawhammer Mike back with Trisha Spencer here. This is a real treat. Once again, we're studying Midwest music. We move from the upper Midwest music, and we're we're studying Midwest music. And Trisha here is one of the things that we value in the upper Midwest. Is we value, you know, at least on my end, we value people who've learned from their family, especially you know grandfathers, great grandfathers, music that's passed down through generations. So you're a great one to talk to for that. So I just want to talk to you in general about how you started off playing music in Kansas there and uh, you know, what what does actually fiddle music means to you and stuff? Okay, great. Well, um, I grew up on a plot of land that was right next to my grandparents in the middle of the country, uh, like in the country, like meaning not in the city. And um, I could go freely back and forth. I mean, it was a little bit of a walk, but because I was in such uh, close proximity to them, I saw them daily. And my grandparents had been making music with each other ever since they got married in 1946. Um, my grandpa started fiddling at uh, the age of two or three. Um, all of his siblings made music. And um, so when I was growing up, I actually thought, everybody probably did the same thing. I didn't realize that uh, making music with your family and living quite like that was actually different. I just, so I didn't know any better until as I got older and I realized my friends had no idea what I was talking about with stuff. And so um, since everybody played, meeting my dad and my uncle and um, of course my grandma and grandpa, the caveat when uh, they were dating each other was my grandpa told her that if he wanted to get married, she would have to learn how to play guitar. So, I mean, this was like pretty set in stone about how they were going to live their life. He was a farmer and for fun, you made music um, or you played horseshoes. I just picked an instrument. I liked the fiddle. Um, I could have picked banjo. My dad's a great three finger style banjo player, but uh, for some reason I liked the fiddle and that's kind of how it all got started. Who did your grandpa learn from? Where did he learn how to play fiddle? He talks about that there were some older fiddlers in, in the area that he learned from. And um, even though my great grandpa didn't fiddle, he must have probably brought over a series of tunes that he learned from his dad, who was a teenager when they left Kentucky. And so my great grandpa actually played harmonica and had a body of tunes that he played on the harmonica. So I think the tunes probably came from him. Some of them would have been from old fiddlers in the area. You know, there's kind of this idea in most people's heads that uh, when they think about it, well, Kansas must have had no music because it's not been documented, you know. You know, you know what I mean. You yeah, know, I do. I never came through and recorded anybody, so there must not have been any fiddlers. But there clearly was fiddlers. There was old time music. It just it not been documented at all, mm -hmm. and so he would have learned from those guys. And then I think you know, for farmers like that, their source of entertainment was the radio. So I know my grandpa heard great fiddling on the radio and learned tunes from there. Do you know any of his contemporaries at all, at least in the area? Uh, well, yeah, of course. You know, he was fiddling the same time Pete McMahon and Cyril Stinnett and Dwight Lamb, all of those folks. They did the contest circuit with each other. And then, of course, my other mentor, Amos Chase, who was another Kansas fiddler nobody knows about. But um, those guys, you know, they did the whole Midwest circuit. So my grandpa, you know, through the 70s when he got into contest fiddling, he heard them a lot. Now, what he was doing in the 50s and 60s and maybe uh, 40s, you know, would have been just what he heard regionally or off of the radio because he didn't do the contest scene then. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, he has some interesting versions of things, probably for several reasons, one of which uh, at that time, 
you might have been able to get somebody on a recorder to take it home, but you might have also just relied on memory, you know, hanging out with somebody, oh, that's a great tune, what can I remember about it right now, I take it home, which is partly why I think his version of Stony Point is like the weirdest tune I have ever heard. It's not like all of the other wild horses at Stony Point. It was probably just, he heard somebody play it and did his best to recreate it and it turned out to be something else. Mm -hmm. Which don't we all end up doing that kind of, you know. What was your relationship with him? Did he teach you a lot of tunes and 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 maybe go into that in detail a little bit? Well, okay, so my grandpa owned a in later in life after kind of his retirement job, he had a gas station in highway on Highway 40, which is this little uh Big Springs is this tiny town like you um literally close your eyes and you've gone past it. Um, but there was a gas station right there, and that kind of connected uh, Lawrence and Topeka, Topeka being the capital of Kansas, Lawrence kind of being its, uh, I don't know, yin-yang kind of thing. And um, so I lived uh, out in Big Springs, and because I lived in the country, my bus had to drop me off somewhere uh, because my parents weren't home. So they dropped me off at my grandpa's gas station. Every day after school, I would hang out with my grandpa where he at the gas station had fiddles after fiddles in this old broken down meat case. Uh, they were just laying on top of each other as well as his favorite fiddle at the station and his guitar. And so when I would come home after school, you know, we would he would maybe get somebody to stop in the store, maybe, I don't know, two or three people per hour. So we would sit up at the gas station and I would learn tunes from grandpa while he was waiting to pump gas for people between customers. So um, from a very early age, as soon as I did my first contest, which I was like a third grader, um, as soon after that, I because I got third and got some money, like, like you wanna inspire a young kid to like get into music, give them some money by doing something. But so I, I knew I wanted to like get better and play better at contests. So my grandpa then just started teaching me his repertoire right from then. And that was basically who I learned from until I was probably like a seventh or eighth grader. And when I beat him in a fiddling contest, which he was very proud of me, he then um, talked to my uh, then later mentor, Amos Chase, to start teaching me because uh, my grandpa thought Amos was a better fiddler than he was and also had kind of a completely different repertoire. So then I started studying with Amos, who was a direct kind of competitor with Pete McMahon, more more of that style than what my grandpa was. Mm -hmm. And um, they were all very good friends with each other. So growing up, it, you know, I would run into Pete, Cyril, uh, Dwight, trying to think of some of the other greats. Uh, there were some great women fiddlers that people don't talk about. Um, Lucy Pierce, who happened to be one of my uh, Kansas City, Kansas mentors. Of course, Vesta. Um, you know, there was just kind of this, uh, kind of like our festival scene is now. There was this contest scene that you got together. You just played the contest so you could see everybody and hang out, you know. Uh -huh. So, so that's where all of my, my beginning tunes came from. And then later, as I got older, they came from Amos because mm -hmm. I was trying to get better contest tunes. Yeah, so. and he, he was mostly a contest fiddler is what you're saying. Amos could do all kinds of stuff, but he had a cleaner contest style. You know, back in the 70s and 80s, uh, the, the fiddling was moving to a more progressive sound. I mean, you know, a lot of... Uh, progressive fiddlers were starting to make their mark and changing what that sound was. And, and quite often I was told that I sounded too old timey and my grandpa sounded too old timey. You know, we hadn't, I was a, a cleaner fiddler than he was, which he was always trying to get that in his fiddling. Um, but he was a better bower then. Now I study a lot about what my grandpa was doing because he did some very unique things because he couldn't get his left hand to do what he wanted it to do. Mm. And, um, but back then, you know, I was just going for that progressive sound that I knew would win a contest. Mm. You know, n none of it had context to me really at that age, like it does now. Yeah. And maybe briefly go into your relationship with Amos Chase and talk about how he was a mentor to you and maybe a few stories about that. We lived in Big Springs, and there's a little town um, that's outside of Topeka called Grantville, 
which across the river by the crow flies was probably, he was probably like five or 10 minutes from us, but because you had to go all the way around uh, LeCompton and get to the bridge and then get back over to Grantville, it took like, I don't know, 30 minutes to get over to Amos's house. And so each week, my dad would drive me over to Amos's house where I would sit with Amos and his wife, Ruby, and uh, learn tune after tune from Amos. Um, which I, I loved Amos's style. There's some recordings of him now that you can find. I know that even uh, uh, Bruce Green ran into Amos years ago and got some nice field recordings yeah. from him because Amos did a little more traveling than what my family did. I mean, we didn't go into Kentucky or anything like that for contests, but, but Amos did. He went into those other states for contest fiddling. He had a much cleaner style than my grandpa's. Um, I know Amos was probably always trying to beat Pete. He, you know, they had a different where I thought Pete was a little more smoother than what Amos was. Um, but Amos was a self-taught fiddler in the area. And um, I kind of just thought of him as another grandparent. And so from the time I was maybe a seventh or eighth grader up into my college years, I was very good friends with Amos and his wife. You know, great recordings and takes on things. As a matter of fact, Amos is, he his favorite backup was two guitars and there's a great recording an album that he put out with eldon ray and glenn woolway where you can hear this just amazing solid uh two guitar backup where they're doing these lovely bass runs into their chords and you almost stop listening to amos and listen to his guitar backup and that's always what howard and i are trying to emulate when we back other people up with two guitars you know, just a great fiddler who had been doing it for a really long time and yes. learned from some of the other Midwest greats. You know, like I said, they were all kind of friends with each other. All right, so that was part one of my interview with Trisha Spencer. I love that story about going to her grandpa's gas station after school and uh, learning tunes, and he had fiddlers. He had fiddles in the old meat case and everything. That stuff That stuff makes my day. Those kind of stories are just, that's that's what makes me like to do this kind of stuff. So uh, we're going to hear, she was talking about Amos Chase, and so we're going to hear her, uh, we're going to hear Amos, and we're going to hear Dwight Lamb. They played together in the duet portion of the contest, up in Yankton, South Dakota at one time. And although you can't really hear Dwight play fiddle, you can hear Amos play backup when it comes time. So this is Amos and Dwight here. <laughs> Thank you. 
Yeah, I hear that uh, one year Amos was judging up at the contest up in Yankton, and that's that's where he ended up dying. So I guess, you know, it's sad that he went out, but it's good to go out doing what you love, you know. So anyways, uh, next up we're going to hear this t part two of this Trisha Spencer interview, and she's going to zero in on a tune and then play us a tune, and it's a great tune, so stick around for this. What tune and the story behind the tune do you want to zero in on today? So um, another fiddler that I don't remember much of, but I knew I ran into a lot when I was younger, is a woman fiddler named Carol Haskell. And she lived in, I think, Kansas City, Kansas, but it might have been Missouri. You know, they're kind of all connected there. Carol Haskell brought into the contest circuit a tune called Spotted Pony. And it's actually in the key of A standard, which she learned from her dad. And I believe her dad, Dad, there's this connection. I, it's in our liner notes of how it all is connected, but it's basically was learned, I think, from Bob Wills's dad, which might be John Wills. But anyway, so Tomb Spotted Pony. Um, anyway, my grandpa heard Carol play it, loved the tune, and so he learned how to play it. And that would, became one of his contest favorites for many years. And so when I was ready to learn my big tune like my big adult tune i'm ready to learn some more notier things um that was like one of the first tunes i remember learning from him and i used that tune for many years as as a contest piece um I, you know it's not like there's anything exciting about it but it's an interesting tune and and it's kind of one of the tunes that i i equate to my grandpa you know it's like my direct lineage from him that um, I remember as a kid. So talk to the people about where we can find your stuff, your stuff with Howard, where we find you online, what you're up to these days. I mean, we know it's COVID right now, but just talk, yeah. to about, talk to us too about anything that you want to promote right now. Since Howard and I met, uh, and I, I guess I should talk a little bit about him. I'm, I'm married to Howard Rains, and uh, we met each other in 2012, got married in 2013. And since we got married, we put out something like I don't know, a CD per year. Howard is pretty well known for his collecting in Texas, and he's dug up a lot of really old tunes that when I first met him, I couldn't believe those tunes weren't out there. I was just, he had version after version. I was like, man, where did you get these? And he's just like, well, you know, I got them from such and such or Library of Congress. And so in the years that we've known each other, we've put out three volumes of these Texas old time tunes. Um, as well as a, a DVD and a CD from the old time Tiki Parlor with David Bragger. And so, if, you know, like if you wanted to know more about Spotted Pony and our history, um, the DVD CD uh, that has Spotted Pony on there uh, has the stories of kind of what I'm telling now. Of course, we have a website. You can find us at spencerandrains.com. And then kind of before the whole virus hit, we finally jumped on Patreon and we do a lot of um, teaching through Patreon. And so I've been kind of, I've been teaching online a lot. I have had more time for art and gardening. I've, I've like just, I've dug up everything in my yard I can possibly think to dig up and replanted it with something else. And trying to think of the days of uh, when we're not all doing this and we're at festivals making music with each other. Yeah. That's definitely the hardest thing right now. Not only the loss of income of all of the work we lost this year, but just nice. the sadness and knowing there's so many friends that we're, we're going to have to wait a whole year until we see, hopefully, you know, so that's yeah. what's kind of going on here in Kansas. <laughs> Thank you for spending time with us today. I'm a huge Spencer and Rain fan. I think you guys is, uh, you know, your harmonies and the way you gel the music together is just amazing. It's great that you spent time with us today and, and let us know about your family's history and the music. There's some really, really great stories. So well, thanks for asking me. It's definitely made me feel like there's a world out there except for the, you know, not the virus one, but there's still a, <laughs> still a world out there. So thanks for having me and letting me tell my stories.
Trisha Spencer and family there. You can't get better old time than that music there, man. They are just great. Um, you know, it was funny. Late last night, I'm getting ready for the show. I put in a bunch of time on the show this week. I was up late last night doing this show, and uh, I, I get this e email from Howard, and uh, Howard's like, you know, are you going to play this? Are you going to play that? Are you going to play this? And I just, I love it. I love that he, you know, he emailed me last night to help out. But one of the things he, I thought was so cute, one of the things he made sure he wanted me to play was uh, a tune by her granddad, Vernon Spencer, who she talked about. And I was thinking about doing it, but I was like, oh, I got a time crunch. And then I was like, screw time crunch. Let's go. You know, I don't even know how long we're going to run tonight. We're just having fun. If you if you fall away, you can watch us later, you know. You know, this show will be archived, so you can watch it in its entirety. I don't know how long we're going to run. We're going to run until we got nothing else to talk about. But anyways, we got another tune to listen to here. This is Vernon Spencer coming up. Trisha's granddad. So next, we're leaving that Lawrence Bid Springs area of Kansas, and we're going to go visit John Williams. Um, John Williams is new to me. I was um, doing interviews for this show, and I was interviewing Charlie Walden, and I asked, you know, I always asked, who, who else do you think I'm missing? Who do you think I'm missing? Who do I really need to get? And he's like, John Williams. And I was like, embarrassingly, I was like, John Williams. I don't, I'd never heard of him before. And then, like, I started looking online, and I started figuring out, and this, this cat, this cat can fiddle. This cat can fiddle. And he's, you know, he learned from some of the greats, you know. And, uh, so this is, this is a cool surprise for me. Um, so anyways, we're gonna do, we're gonna do the John Drive here. We're gonna go from Lawrence, Kansas, and we're gonna go back up to Madison, Missouri, there. And we're gonna visit John here. So, John Williams. This is Clawhammer Mike here with John Williams. He's from Madison, Missouri. I was put on to him by Charlie Walden. Charlie Walden, when I, when I interviewed him, he said, oh, you have to get John Williams from Madison, Missouri. Now I've had a chance to hear him a few times, really good fiddler. And uh, we're, we're, we're happy to have you. Uh, will you talk a little bit about, you know, your history and how you got started playing fiddle? Uh, thanks for having me, too, by the way. No uh, problem. Oh, I got, well, started playing when I was seven, uh, but my mom and my grandma and, well, my family would take me to the local fiddle contests and whatnot, and especially the the biggest influence, you know, in wanting to learn how to play was uh, going to Bethel, Missouri, which is just, oh, not even an hour north of where our family farm is, and Bethel's kind of like the mecca in Missouri for, you know, Missouri fiddling and all that. And so I, you know, seeing Pete McMahon and Dwight Lamb and all these other fantastic fiddlers, you know, Charlie Walden uh, playing up there. And I started, you know, asking about the age I was four, 
if I could, you know, like, I really, I want to do what those guys are doing. Mm-hmm. And you know, I, I, I was persistent enough over, over time that, you know, it wasn't just, you know, a kid that wanted a pony. It was, you know, started taking classical lessons at the age of seven because, you know, I understand now why <laughs> they didn't want to take a seven-year-old on as a student, but mm. uh, took, took classical lessons for, oh, well, let's see, five, six years. But uh, the big thing was I just wanted to be a fiddle player. I didn't want to play Suzuki and all that. But I think I was eight years old. I went to the Bethel Fiddle Camp for the first time, and that was, you know, where it all started for me was, you know, Bethel especially, you know. And then now I was getting to go there myself and learn from the guys that, you know, inspired me to pick it up at a young age. Went there from the time I was eight until I was 18. And then I've been teaching there most of the time since. Who was your first, your, the first fiddler who maybe taught you a tune or took you under his wing? Who was, who was the first one like that? And then which of the legends have influenced you the most as far as the Midwest tradition goes? Oh, Pete McMahon number one uh i was lucky enough to study with him through the missouri folk arts program whenever i was in high school i got to hang out and learn with bob holt and you know festa johnson i still get to teach with festa johnson who is 98 years old Mm -hmm. and we'll fiddle circles around everybody up there all week long Mm -hmm. Uh, you know dwight lamb i still Still get to see him from time to time, play tunes with him. He he taught me as a kid. In the last few years, I've really got interested in Lonnie Robertson from Springfield, Missouri area. Mm-hmm. Radio fiddler from down south in the Ozarks, but I wouldn't say at Ozarks fiddle player. More kind of like a hybrid between Missouri Valley, such as Bob Walters and Casey Jones and so your own personal repertoire, what kind of tunes are they? Where do they mostly come from? The majority of them I've learned from Pete during, you know, from the time of just taking lessons here and there. And then we had a pretty intensive uh, apprenticeship in 1998 and 99, I believe it was. And I've got tons of recordings and stuff like that. And I, I still go back and find tunes that I didn't know he played and I'm well, I need to add that one in there. But most of them, I would say, are from this region. You know, I, I'm just north of Boone County. And around here, we kind of call it the Boone County style, even though it's technically what uh, they call Little Dixie style, which is between the Missouri Valley style and Ozark style. Oh, yeah. Interesting. Um, do you have any good stories about Pete and your time with Pete when you were when you're hanging with him? <laughs> well, uh, they don't I, have I, to I, be PG if you if if uh, they <laughs> if they are, you know, that's just fine. Um, the the one story I really enjoy telling, especially to the people I'm, you know, the few people I do give lessons to, is uh, you know, Pete was adamant on using this finger, you know. He said you were cheating if you were playing an open string. And so I was, mm. well, started taking the lessons, you know, once or twice a week at 15 years old, full time. And uh, he would uh, get on to me if I, you know, you, you know, be running up the D string and then go to hit an A and I would just hit an open A and he would whack me on the shin with his bow and say, damn it, boy. <laughs> why do you think you could never play an open string what do you think was behind that well it kind of goes with the style mm-hmm. you know just you're you're getting more volume and then you know if you can and it's also faster too you know if you're just running up rather than crossing over to another string mm-hmm. you know you're just one two and then four you know the closer we got you know the little more patient and understanding he he was but uh, uh, he was yeah. you know a guy from the greatest era and so he didn't mince words you know if you didn't get it right it's like you know why can't you get it right or what's wrong with you right that's what i was gonna say that's one way of learning quick 
is when somebody's like that. So yes. yeah, I mean these old timers they they lived in a different world, you know, than we live in now. You know, wasn't wasn't as sensitive as the world is what from my understanding of uh, the stories yes. that other fiddlers tell about the old the old timers. So all right, so. Well, John brings up Pete McMahon, and everybody brings up Pete McMahon. So uh, we gotta we gotta play a Pete tune here. Um, he was a big influence on everybody down there in the Midwest, from what I can tell. So let's do this up. <laughs> Thank you also to Howard Rains for sending me that one. Um, we're going to go listen to John a little bit more, and this is the point of the interview where he starts zeroing in on tune, and then he's going to play us a fine tune. So this, this is fun. What's important to you about the uh, Midwest tradition, Midwest fiddle tradition? What, what do you think are its most important characteristics to you? There's only certain tunes that, you know, people play around here, or actually very few people play around here anymore and I grew up in a family that you know that was really practiced in different traditions like my mom she's a basket weaver from trees that we would cut off the farm my dad was a blacksmith my grandfather was a wheelwright and built wagons you know I, I grew up doing all these things and spent a lot of time around a lot of the older generation and so tradition was pretty much instilled in me from the beginning and then you know the more I got involved with fiddling you know especially here and after you know people like Howard Marshall took me under their wing Charlie Walden Bill Shull you know Niall Wilson you know just seeing that it was kind of a fading you know art around here really kind of pushed me to you know take a more active part in trying to help preserve all this um how many fiddlers are there in your area now would you say who play the old style the old midwest style in my area not that many except for you know let's see i've had four students through the missouri folk arts program that i've mm -hmm. taught my style to and or Little Dixie fiddling and but you know there's there's a handful in Columbia that do and but in this area that are my age you know less than 10. That's sad and that's kind of the story all over um, people there's a lot of kids who want to play festival style but uh, there's not a lot of regional kids who want to play regional style you know what I'm saying in in their own region whether it be Midwest or wherever it might be you know so what tune do you want to focus in on today oh well uh, I didn't practice anything beforehand uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, there's a tune that is pretty special to Pete that he kind of you know, recalled from the back of his head, uh, you know, after he'd been playing for a long time that he had learned from uh, his instructor or his teacher, I guess probably not an instructor back in, you know, 100 years ago, but uh, from Clark Atterbury that's called Gilsaw that, you know, it 
it's kind of made its way to the festival style too. Yes. And so we're, I, I, we're, I'm trying to reclaim it, you know, as, you know, a little Dixie tune and mm -hmm. it, it's played not in cross tune, <laughs> well, there which you I've go. heard too many times on the internet. Uh-huh. Yeah. I just suppose you guys never do a cross tune to you down there. Uh, occasionally there's a, there's a handful of tunes, but you know, uh -huh. fiddle strings are expensive. So yeah it's true you don't want to break too many of those <laughs> yeah it's, it's stressful whenever you're tuning tuning up like that uh-huh yeah there there there's a handful you know i i learned a few from nile wilson and pete had showed me a couple cross tune pieces but uh -huh. you know, they don't get played too often around here yeah so jill saw as you tune today and um we'll be listening to that in a second here um what um what do you have any websites or anything you want to promote any type of music you want to promote and i know we're under covid right now but um do you have anything anything like that i've got a youtube page there you go with you know free you know there's a handful of like slowed down versions of tunes that i've put up to help the students that i had or just what's your um band camp page do you know Oh, just search John P. Williams or John P. Williams Jr. Well, I want to thank you so much for spending time with us today. It's just always fascinating to hear about, you know, the same stuff happening in the same regions. You know, when you talk about how, the, just how you talked about the traditions kind of going away. Your predecessors, your, your family, they all were engaged in a lot of different kind of traditions. But just traditional mm -hmm. arts in general have kind of gone by the wayside, unfortunately, whether it be fiddle or whether it be bastard weaving or whatever it might be. So it's just cool that you're down there keeping, keeping your little bit alive down there. And like you say, there's not a lot of other folks down there doing it, but uh, we appreciate that you're doing it. So thanks for being on the show today. Yeah, thank you very much for having me. I appreciate it. Yeah, so that's my new friend John Williams, my new internet friend. Like I told said before, I hadn't heard him before uh, getting to know him this week. So now I'm gonna, you know, gonna make sure I maintain good connections with him. And I love the stuff he was saying about that, uh, the tr traditional arts, and also this whole kind of feeling that you know, like if you if you've watched my old shows, the Upper Midwest shows, you've seen me talk about how you know. The traditions have just been lost. Um, our musical traditions, you know, I mean, I almost look at it like, you know, it's a, it's been a minor war on our traditions, you know, in the sense that uh, there's TV and computers and video games and nobody wants to learn, you know, the traditional music of my region, the upper Midwest. Well, we hear on the similar scale that there's still something still going on in the Midwest that's like that. 
only, you know, he says that, you know, a dozen or so fiddlers that he can count in the area that play his tunes, you know. And uh, I think that, you know, if anything, hopefully shows like this or stuff that encourages cultures like this will get more, especially kids involved, man, because that's what we need. We need these kids. They're picking up, they're playing back in, um, in, you know, schools and stuff. Well, why can't why can't more of these kids be playing the music from their region? That you know, not not that Midwest music will ever die, because you got all these great folks who we're talking to today. But you know, these traditions are um, you know almost almost like under attack, and uh, we got to do our part to make sure that uh, you know folks are folks are playing the tunes, folks are playing the music. Anyways, that's that's my rant. We're all done with that for now. But um, we heard John's tune. Now we're gonna go visit. This is. This is this is a hot spot for me. We got uh, Nathan McAllister coming up. He's uh, he's a great young player down in uh, Missouri there, and uh, I just really like this guy. He's a he's a storm chaser. You know that's that's right after my head. I love I love the tornado chasing, and he plays everything he pits up is gold, man. He, dulcimer, bluegrass, banjo, old time fiddle. This dude this dude's got it, and he's just a cool dude. So let's go visit him. First, we got to drive down there like we always do. Driving down to Granby, Missouri there. And that's right on the border. As we're going to talk about, he has some great, great, great stuff he says about being so close to three different borders there. So we're going to get into this interview now. All right, it's Clawhammer Mike back here with Nathan McAllister. He's one of the great young fiddlers down in the Midwest area, I really, really enjoy his fiddling. Every time I see him on uh, the internet playing a tune, it just kind of sparks my interest. I think he's one of one of the best youngins that's out there, whether it be in the Midwest or anywhere. You know, just just a great fiddler. And he's into tornado chasing, and he's into banjo. So you know, I like I like this kid. So we're going to interview him today and talk about. My first question would be, what? What got you into fiddle music of the Midwest in the first place, or just fiddle music in general? Well, I started playing when I was pretty young, uh, and my parents have always been involved in uh, living history presentations, going to things where this music's typically played at. You know, we, we know what gigs we have, and a lot of times we play at those kind of events, um, be it fall festivals or square dances or things like that. And so... I was always being brought to one of those kinds of things. And so I was around fiddle playing a lot um, when I was, was quite young. And we had, I remember the first time I ever heard a fiddle being played, I was in elementary school and we had a librarian in town that would come to the elementary schools and do a fiddle presentation. And his name was Billy Johnson. And, and Billy was a, a really, really great Missouri style you know, Heartland fiddle player. Uh, and he would come to school and with his fiddle and his whole family played. And so he would do the presentation with these great tunes and heavily corded waltzes and things like that. And I just remember being very young and telling my folks, you know, I want, I want to do that. And I never wanted to play the violin. I wanted to play the fiddle. And then I got into banjo playing about the same time. Yeah, and then what, what was your early influences when you are when you're learning fiddle? What did you, what were you concentrating on? Well, back then, a lot of the, the, what we called the old guys were still around playing at the, you know, they just called them hoot nannies down here. Um, and every Saturday night, there was usually a different hoot nanny at an old rural schoolhouse. And they kind of divided up, you know, who would be having it for each week into the month. And my grandmother, uh, love to go to those and my my next door neighbor built fiddles and so he would go with her and we would just go to these suit nannies and listen to these old guys play and I remember we had a, a fiddle player down here um, by the name of Leonard Smith that was a one-armed fiddle player wow. and some some folks may be familiar with him I know there's some video of him on YouTube uh, and he, you know listening to him play and a lot of those those just old timers play music and the the thing that was really great about it is they didn't those old guys didn't divide things up by genre they didn't have down here at least they didn't have the bluegrass crowd and the quote-unquote old-time crowd and and western crowd it was just music everyone said we're just gonna i just like music i just like playing music and so we would go listen to that and 
So then as you kind of matured, as your style matured, who did you end up gravitating towards in the Midwest style? Around here, if you're going to play uh, in jams and things, you're obviously going to play a lot of Bob Holt tunes, um, which, you know, was a, a fiddle player from Douglas County, Missouri, you know, notorious um, fiddle player for square dances, uh, played really fast, played a lot of amazing tunes. Um, Lyman Inlow, of course, a great uh, Missouri fiddle player that was uh, just one of the greats, you know, and then, you know, Cyril Stennett to an extent uh, from a more, you know, Northern style. Uh, and then, but there were a lot of great Arkansas fiddlers uh, and Oklahoma fiddlers too, that I listened to um, Uncle Dick Hutchinson uh, and Earl Collins, those kinds of guys uh, that were just great Ozark fiddle players from, you know, here in the Southwest corner of Missouri Northwest Arkansas and into extreme um, Eastern Oklahoma. But, you know, I, I just like good fiddle playing. Uh, and I, I think I can recognize it, you know, when I hear it, I love a lot of Eastern players uh, and Appalachian stuff. And I love a whole lot of um, Texas exhibition style fiddling as well. So I, I try and stay pretty diverse in my taste. I, I don't try to pigeonhole myself in the, into one area. And I, I just tried to do that throughout the course of, of my my playing history because uh, I do play a lot of bluegrass. I played obviously claw hammer banjo and I, I grew up playing bluegrass banjo as well and running with some of those guys. So uh, I just love it all, man. You know, I, I just love hearing the music played. All right. So that was Nate McAllister. And one of the folks he mentioned was Earl Collins and uh, Earl Collins is one of my favorite fiddlers on tape. I just, I love the way he plays. Uh, he, Earl was one of those guys who was in Missouri, but then went to Oklahoma at a young age, midst around there, played a bunch of, um, you know, dances and stuff in Oklahoma with his fam, and then eventually moved out to California. And they loved him out there because, you know, he was like an authentic old-timey fiddler out there in California. So we're going to hear Earl Collins here. I love that little Dutch girl song. We play that tune up here at our jams, and we just we've all, we've always loved that one. So next up, we're gonna hear the rest of our uh, Nathan McAllister interview here, and then he's gonna play us a great tune too, man. The tunes just keep coming here. When you talk about just the regional music itself, what do you think differentiates it from uh, other areas? Yeah, d down here, I think our playing is just predominantly revolving around square dance fiddle uh we play a ton 
uh, square dances. I, I shouldn't say a ton. I say most of the bulk of our gigs are square dances here. Um, and I know the, you know, a long time ago, obviously they used to, to play square dances almost every night, you know, and that's of course tapered off as that's fallen a little bit out of fashion, but I think it, you know, these things tend to run in cycles. Uh, and square dancing down here is, has certainly picked up. Obviously it's taken hit with the, the COVID-19 situation, but most of our, our fiddling down here is, is square dance fiddling. It's fast fiddling uh, that's just played with a whole lot of drive. And that's, that's just kind of the folks that I run with. So and I think that's what I love so much about the region I'm from is because here in, in the portion of Missouri that I'm in, I am so close to Arkansas and Oklahoma whilst, and Kansas. I'm 30 minutes from Kansas, I'm 30 minutes from Oklahoma, and I'm 30 minutes from Arkansas. Wow. And so it's, I'm in a situation where I can get on I-44 and I can drive an hour east and I'm deep into the, the traditional Ozarks kind of areas. Uh, where your musical influence uh, definitely pulls more from the kind of, at least your fiddling traditions are going to pull more from uh, Tennessee, Kentucky type of tradition, or, or even uh, there's a big love of bluegrass. But then I can get on I-44 and I can drive an hour west and you're deep in the heart of Bob Wills country, you know, mm -hmm. and you're down in Oklahoma, you're at Kane's Ballroom in Tulsa, and it's just very western you know, influenced music. And that's what's so awesome about it is because it's a great melting pot here. There's not one defining style of music that just overtakes everything else here. There's a, a great variety. Well, that's fascinating. Really fascinating. Um, what, uh, what tune do you want to zero in on today? Uh, I think today I, I was going to do do you Sunday Night Real from Art Galbraith? Um, and it's hard for me to pick a meaningful tune because I think I would be just, you know, doing a, a disservice to all the other great tunes that I tune in the uh, video. And the theme music for that program is done by Gordon McCann and Art Galbraith. Art Galbraith was a fiddler from Springfield, Missouri, and then Gordon McCann. Um, most, you know, music conservators and folk folklorists out there will, will recognize the name Gordon McCann. Gordon has done, you know, as much for Missouri fiddling as anybody. His, his database of, of tunes that he supplied to Missouri State University is just extremely expansive. Um, thousands and thousands and thousands of hours of, of traditional Missouri fiddle playing. And the reason this is meaningful to me, I guess, is because it was the defining moment when I recognized this tune and the style of backup and what now we would call the Missouri rules. You've heard the Missouri rules of backup. Um, I don't, I don't have a guitar player with me here right now that would really illustrate that, but to listen to the theme music of Ozarks watch. And it was a program we watched every Sunday night as a family um, that just documented different happenings in, in the Ozarks region uh, and, and often focused on music. But to hear that theme music every week, uh, it was really driving home the the Missouri type of fiddle playing, especially here here to the Ozarks. You can't think of Ozarks fiddling and not not think of Art Galbraith. All right, so thanks for being with us today. Uh, we want to talk about what what music you want to promote or what 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 what's out there that that you you do that we can find on the internet. Uh, the the easy answer is Larry Warren's Slippery Hill. Uh, I don't know if anyone else has gave that answer yet, but Slippery Hill to me is one of the defining resources that I've used, it seems like 800 years now, to go find great collections of, of fiddle tunes uh, that you can select by tune name, you can select by tuning, you can select by the fiddle player, you can select by the region. And I would just encourage everyone to get on there and find something, a niche, uh, that just really speaks to you. There's great Oklahoma fiddling on there. There's great Arkansas fiddling um, from from some of the big names that you've heard. And this ranges from people like Uncle Dick Hutchinson all the way through through Byron Burline. You know, um, just a, a huge database of great fiddle tunes uh, uh, and recordings that range all the way. You know, from the 20s 
up, up until, you know, the 70s and 80s and 90s. So go check out Larry Warren's Slippery Hill and get you some good fiddle tunes. There's plenty of, of tunes there to keep you busy throughout the quarantine. All right. Well, thank you for spending time with us today. No problem. Um, Thanks for on. It's been big fun. And I really just like every time I see one of your things on the internet, whether it's tornado chasing or whether it's a new tune on the fiddle, new tune, tune on the banjo, really just brightens my day. So I appreciate you from up here to down there. I'm going to have to get up there and play with you guys. Oh, for sure. Someday, someday it'll happen yep. once this COVID crap is over. So Yeah, I was hoping to make it to Chroma. You know, I was hoping to see everybody. Mm -hmm. And, uh, man, it's it's just been a weird year all around. Real weird year. All right, thanks again, buddy. See you later. All right, thank you. We'll see you. Bye-bye. That was Nathan. He was great. It's almost past our bedtime, but we're going to keep going here. We're going to go from Granby, Missouri up to St. Louis, Missouri. We're going to go visit Jeff Seitz. This is Claw Hammer Mike here, continuing with the Midwest fiddle traditions. Today we got a really special guest. We're talking to Jeff Seitz. Jeff Seitz I've seen a couple times at the Minnesota Bluegrass and Old Time Music Association gathering. He plays a great old time Midwest fiddle. He's really, really great fiddler. Um, we're going to talk to him today about, you know, who he learned from and how he got started. So let's start off with that. How did you get started off playing fiddle in the first place down there? Okay. Uh, Mike, thanks for the compliment and thanks for having me on your show here. That's really great. Um, oh, yeah. I appreciate it. You know, believe it or not, my dad played a little bit around the house here. He played fiddle and mandolin. Although, you know, I was a, I grew up when the Beatles came here to, to the United States and I was a Beatles fan and rock and roll all the way. And then when I was in college, or uh, when I was about 20, I uh, started, you know, drifting back kind of towards the countryside of life, you know, and, and I was actually raised on a little farm and the whole deal, but then started drifting away from the rock and roll stuff and more into the uh, uh, country stuff and then got in, heard the bluegrass because of uh, Nitty Gritty Dirt Band's great Will of Circle Band Broken album and then and then just went from there um, in night, you know, started meeting people that played just old time fiddle music and uh, at college and and um, uh, here and there and went to a festival, went to the Galax Festival in 1974. And that just completely blew my mind. I've never I couldn't believe it. It was like, man, this is what I like. I like this kind of stuff. So what a festival uh, that is, the Galax Festival. Oh, my God. And, and yeah, and it was really something because. You know, there was the bluegrass and the old time, just saturated music, you know, and playing 24, it was just incredible. And it's in the mountains and it was just really cool. So, you know, that kind of put me on the path to like, well, hey, I need to work on this stuff here and and uh, do that. So, and then when you start figuring things out, I, real, I found out that there's this incredible tradition, incredible music in Missouri and in the Missouri Valley, Arkansas, up through uh, Iowa and uh, uh, Nebraska and all up and through there and uh, and then they used to have in the 70s there was a lot of fiddle contests around the St. Louis area and the outlying areas and there were a lot of things like that and all these old guys would gather there and you get to meet all of these incredible guys like R.P. Christensen, like Pete McMahon, like you know and man that was like I mean, for a, just like someone kind of getting into it and trying to, you know, get yourself into it, that was a real fantastic way to just zoom right into it because those guys were just the best. 
and they were really welcoming and it was really really great which of those old timers were the first ones you really learned some tunes from? Who who befriended you the the first? You know, you know at, at the fiddle contest, really R.P. Christensen. You know, Bob Christensen was really nice to people. He if he was one of these kind of guys that uh, if you were interested in, in the music, then he thought that that was a good thing and that he was going to be your friend. You know. There, back in those days, you know, there was like this, we had the long haired hippie stuff and the redneck stuff going too. And it, it, some people would be a little skeptical about long haired young guys playing the fiddle. So, you know, they weren't always, you know, warm. Not everyone would be warm to you, but, mm. uh, but RP was always warm. Uh, guy, uh, uh, Taylor McBain from down in <clears throat> Columbia, Missouri. He was like, just really great. Pete McMahon was always real good. Pete, you know, Pete was, a uh, uh, he was a kind of had a rough character about him, but he was, if, if you were in fiddling, then he was with you, you know? So most of the guys, if you were into it, they were okay with you, with you, you know? Uh-huh. Yeah. And, and when you started learning specifically tunes in the Midwest tradition, where did you get most of your material from or how did you build repertoire? How did that, how do you go about that? <laughs> it was a combination of the old time fiddlers repertoire, repertory, repertoire repertory uh which was by bob chris robert christensen uh christensen no end in there uh and that had the notes and so that was a great resource i could read a little bit because i used to play piano as well and stuff and then going around and recording guys with my uh with my recorder at at the festivals and fiddle contests and stuff like that so then i would record all the old guys too, and learn stuff by ear and by note. So I did it, you know, with both ways. There was a, a young bunch of people that were playing around here. They used to be, they have a band called the Missouri Corn Dodgers. And, uh, and Jim Olin and Julia Olin were part of that group. Another guy, Bob Abrams, there were a couple other people. But Jim and Julia were really collecting Midwest fiddle players really strongly, you know. And I remember meeting Jim uh, one time at a festival and wanted to get in a jam session with him. And so we were gotten a, got our fiddles out and we were playing a little bit. And I'm like, well, do you play blah, blah, blah from like Appalachia, you know, some tune. He goes, well, yeah, I kind of do. But right now I'm playing a lot more of this kind of Midwestern, you know, and I'm like, oh, really? You know, and so right that right at that, that moment, uh, I realized, oh, wait a minute. You know, there is this kind of field of study which is happening already. And, mm. and I'm thinking, you know, that I checked that out a little bit. That's, you know, that's pretty interesting, you know, yeah. That, yeah. And, uh, and he got into it deep because those, him and Julia used to go record all kinds of people in the mid, like all kinds of people, everyone. Mm. What would you say are the distinctive, uh, distinctive signatures of Midwest fiddling? Being that I tra I've traveled a lot and I've studied it really carefully, I've noticed that people who have a lot of technique and really know how to play the instrument will play, will play very similar to a guy in another part of the country that has a lot of skill level as well. So, so when, you, when you like go to Appalachia and you listen to a guy like Benton Flippin, mm -hmm. who has a lot of, well, he's dead, but not when you used to, he has a lot of skill level he had a lot of the sound that the guys in the Midwest that had a lot of skill level as well, too. They, they had a similar kind of sound. They played different tunes and the mm -hmm. tunes, you know, would be kind of Midwestern. So I'm thinking it's more mid tune related. The Midwestern stuff can tend to be a little notey, but not always. The, the Ozark stuff, it can be pretty, pretty dancey and pretty slippery, you know? Mm -hmm. So, uh, but there is some notey stuff. So if you're going to play the notey stuff, you do have to have some technique to, to pull it off. So let's zero in on a tune. What tune today in the Midwest tradition do you find important or is there a good story behind that you'd like to talk about today and play? I like the tune Lantern in the Ditch. Yeah. Uh, I hung out a lot with Bob Holt, who was a really great dance fiddler. Talk about guys that, you know, he, he could play some noty stuff, but he, mo he played a lot of just dance, fast, dancey stuff. All right, so we cut it off there because he brought up Bob Holt. 
Isn't this just a good chance to play a Bob Holt tune here? Bob Holt's just a great fiddler, man. This tune, Rattlesnake, is great. I should mention, this CD, the Bob Holt CD, and the Vernon Spencer CD, you can get at the Field Recorders Collective, and that's uh, fieldrecorders.org, and they just have so much good stuff, not just Midwest stuff. They got stuff. They, they, they have CDs for days of just great field recordings of traditional music. So definitely check them out. But right here, we're going to get Bob Holt tune, and this tune is hot. Bob, Bob Holt there, great great tune. Let's go back to Jeff. I think he was about to zero in on uh, Lantern in the Ditch and tell a little story about it here. I like the tune Lantern in the Ditch. Yeah. Uh, I hung out a lot with Bob Holt, and he played, uh, and he was from down in Ava, Missouri, which is kind of down in the Springfield area, down in the uh, southwest part of Missouri. He played that tune, and all those guys down around there also played that tune, but... The fellas up north, like Cyril Stinnett uh, and Casey Jones, Dwight Lamb, all those guys played it as well. And in fact, Casey Jones' father named the tune. His, his father was John Jones, was his name. And apparently, they were riding in a wagon coming back from somewhere, and there were a, a bunch of musicians, and they were playing a tune. And it was getting dark, and they saw a lantern off in the distance. And so, and he apparently played this tune and it never had really a name. So he stuck the name to it. Oh, so, I never knew that story. Yeah, nobody, that's a kind of a obscure story, but that's how that went, you know, but the tune is so good. It would, everybody played it all over the place, you know? Mm -hmm. It's so, a great tune. I think I've only heard Red play it, but it's a great tune. Yeah. Yeah. Red plays it great. Yeah. yeah. Cool. So we're going to listen to you play that coming up right now, um, just in a little bit here. What uh, else would you like to tell us about, uh, you know, where can we find your music and what's going on these days? We know it's COVID times, but uh, yeah. where, where where can we interface with you and what bands are you playing in these days, if you have any, anything yeah. like that? Um, well, I do play with a band called Dugout Canoe that I, that I you know, with Dave Landreth and uh, Andy Gribble and uh, Michael Jonas. And so we we were playing some festivals here and there. And now because of COVID, no one's really doing anything right now. And I have a Facebook page for my shop too, Jeffrey Seitz Violin Maker. And uh, I spent a lot of time at the shop too. So that's, you know, that's kind of one of the things that happens. 
end up yeah. working a lot. Well, thank you a lot for spending time with us today. It's been thank been you. great. And thank uh, you, Mike. Thank you so much. Been I've, been lo- I've been loving the stories that people have been telling, all the all the great Midwest stories. And it's really it was important for me that we made sure we catch up with you. So I'm really, really glad you agreed to do yeah. this. Well, I'm I'm really proud to play the music. You know, one of my best friends and my favorite fiddlers was was R. P. Christison, Bob Christison, that wrote the old time fiddlers repertory. And he went around and recorded guys on an old wire recorder, and you know, and he was just always the nicest guy and always good to me. And 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 he was my favorite. I love the way he played. He was kind of under recorded as well. He, you don't hear a lot of his recordings of him playing, but he was a great fiddler. He's really fantastic. And really did a lot to preserve this kind of, uh, you know, Missouri Valley stuff. He was very key in keeping it going, you know. And so I'll always give him my shout outs. <laughs> That's great. All right. Well, thanks. Thanks for visiting with us. Thanks, have, Mike. Have a good one. Take care. This is Lantern in the Ditch. Yep, right there is an award-winning fiddler. A bunch of these guys are award-winning fiddlers, but uh, Jeff just, as it just said in the chat, uh, Jeff ripped one right there for sure. Uh, we're going to, next, we're going to go, you know, we're dealing with traditional music, so, you know, we can't ignore uh, the singing part of it. So, uh, you know, especially down in the Ozarks, there's just some great ballad traditions, you know. Uh, one of my favorites is old Granny Riddle. She was just a great singer. So um, we're not going to ignore it. We're going to go down to, uh, you know, I, I think Willie just wants me to say he's from the Ozarks, but I know he lived a bunch in Fateville, so we're going to go down there and uh, visit Willie Carlisle. Willie Carlisle, um, he's a great young singer, accordion player, fiddler, uh, all these, all these things. He can do it all. His songs are his songs are just wonderfully written, and he plays old time too. So let's go visit Willie. All right, this is Clawhammer Mike here, back with Willie Carlisle. This is a special episode for me. I really like Willie's work. Willie's an excellent singer, and banjo player, excellent accordion player, excellent fiddler. Um, I like how Willie's really diverse. He plays a lot of different stuff. He does old time music. He does, you know, stuff. I just heard him off camera playing a Mexican tune on the accordion. Um, and plus he's just a phenomenal songwriter, just really great songs. I, let me tell you something right now. Let me admit something. I hate modern folk music. I hate it. <laughs> but I love Willie's stuff. Almost every single one of Willie's songs is great. So without further ado, we got Willie Carlisle here. Willie, will you tell us how you got into music just in general? Uh, sure, yeah. Um, my father used to run sound at the uh, Winfield Festival uh, in Kansas, that huge bluegrass festival. And um, I was there in the womb 
Uh, but for the most part, um, I came to music through the old records that were sitting around in his house, uh, in our house, and, and I really wasn't allowed to touch them, but when everybody left, uh, I was allowed, I got them out, and we had things like the Cheap Suit Serenaders, and weirdly yeah. like a lot of cowboy music, um, and we had a lot of people through the house, um, sort of billets, you know, for the festival, so I would kind of meet these old guys, um, and my dad would hang out with these old guys, and I didn't know they were cool, and that they were that they were John Hartford or, you know, whatever. Um, uh, and then as soon as I was a teenager and I was rebelling, it was like I, I discovered square dancing and it was like over. So I was totally ready, but not into it. And then as soon as I discovered that you could hold hands with a bunch of pretty boys and girls, um, I just was, just was sold forever. You actually make, you know, a living doing this, touring and stuff like that. I mean, not many musicians can say that. Not many traditional musicians out there can say that these days. So how's that going for you? Uh, you know, really well. And, and it's growing just about as fast as I can handle it. Um, it's good to be a songwriter and a traditional musician. I don't view those things as diametrically opposed. Um, and uh, And I feel really fortunate to be able to do a sort of a lot of a lot of both it's been it's just it's just been fascinating because you meet a lot of great musicians that have no sort of that don't have much tradition or or don't have like the key what i think of as the key to the kingdom and this like great series of sources and uh, and also just stand up human beings they're like a community that they'll go to because like you, I can walk into a square dance or a polka dance or just about any kind of American vernacular community and like have a really great time. And um, I think that's something that's missing from a lot of people's lives, but also that's missing from a lot of the fabric of like American, American music or especially in the Americana arena, you know, where I think we are really lucky. And um, I think that sometimes we forget that. Talking about your relationship with traditional Midwestern music, um, what you think is important about it and your relationship with it in general? American Midwestern music as, as an epitome of the diaspora of American folk music. So uh, like a great example would be um, the playing of the Midwestern fiddler and banjo player, Bill Conley from whom um, I learned stuff that he learned from his great grandfather who was born and raised in Kentucky, who almost certainly learned those banjo techniques either from minstrel songbooks or from sort of very, very old 19th century stroke style playing um, that would have been popular on the East Coast. Um, so that's a really long answer to say that um, I'm mostly interested in diasporas in the way that things spread around and looking for unity as opposed to division, it's really easy to find division, but also I think what we learn from the things like the child ballads, but also um, the proliferation of the squeeze box among so many different cultures and that uh, there's, um, that we have a whole lot in common. Um, and I think that in, uh, because we're all sort of here together in late capitalism, and we all get divested of our culture by people that want to buy our interest, advertisements and stuff like that, that um, uh, the diaspora of traditional music, um, especially in a place like the Midwest and the flyover states, is a really interesting way to kind of reclaim some ancient epistemic territory that gets denied to us. Uh, maybe the short version of that is, um, you can't really buy traditional music or traditional communities and, um, it's that's what makes it important um and also that's part of what makes the spread of the music important and give to everybody because it's always free but we really do have to have strong strong regional regional connections in regards to that in, in you know in in regards to traditional music because it's so vastly different from place to place or even just and these differences are are like extremely important um especially for the practitioners but um, a lot of the benefit that like, sort of human beings get from it is the same. All right. So what are some of the musicians from the Midwest that have inspired you over the years, whether they're still around or whether they're musicians gone by, uh, musicians and singers I'm talking about here? Well, I, I got to do, you know, everybody that you're having on is just terrific. Um, uh, Nathan McAllister has been really generous uh, with me and uh, I, I still own a guitar of his. Um, I've been learning from uh, I've been learning from Chirps and Charlie Walden a lot. Um, uh, I got a shout out to Dwight Lamb. Um, as far as singers go, 
uh, the ghosts of Almeida Riddle and Emma Dusenberry and Felicity Fox and Ollie Gilbert. Um, and uh, I also, um, a great folklorist from the Ozarks uh, that is also just an amazing tune hound is uh, Rachel Reynolds, lives down in Meadow Creek, Arkansas, uh, near Fox, Arkansas, where Jimmy Driftwood was from. All right, so uh, what tune do you want to zero in on today? Uh, well, I thought I would do, um, you asked for a ballad, so I thought I would do um, uh, Fair Willie Was Drowned in the Yarrow. I love um, this jam. I sing, really? <laughs> I sing this jam with uh, me and my fiddler. We sing it uh, acapella. We love this jam. Oh, well, so you know it already. Good. Yes. <laughs> I hope you haven't played it on the show like last time. We don't play songs on the show. We just play tunes mostly. So, oh, okay. You know. um, I know it's a child ballad. Um, I know that, uh, uh, that she sang several different versions of it, but sang it the same way all the way through. And I know that the that the story that Almeida's version tells is very, is really pretty simple, but that the child ballad, like many of them, is, uh, tells a very, very twisty tale indeed. <laughs> Can't wait to hear the song. I love this song and I, and I haven't heard you sing it, so this is going to be fun. So thanks, right, thanks for, for being with me. us. Thanks for putting all that together. You got it. See you later. I want to quickly dedicate uh, this song to the first annual queer and trans old time music gathering which is happening next May in Wisconsin. Get a hold of me about it if you want to know more. Oh, my willy is rare, my willy is fair. My will is wondrous bonny, and he promised that he'd marry me if he ever did marry with any. Oh, and sister dear, I've had this dream. I fear it does mean sorrow. I dreamed I saw the heather green on the bonny banks of the arrow. Oh, and sister dear, I'll tell your dream. I fear it does mean sorrow. I saw you fall the heather green on the bonny banks of the arrow. And she looked upstream, she looked downstream in much distress and sorrow. She found him where the heather was green. Fair Willie was drowned in the arrow, and her hair it was three quarters long, and the color it was yellow, and she tied it round his middle small, and pulled him out of the arrow. And last night her bed was made full wide. Tonight it shall be narrow, for no man ever sleeps by her side. Fair Willie was drowned in the arrow. <laughs> All right, well, last but not least, we're going to grow up from Arkansas, and, uh, you know, it's hard to follow that uh, that uh, dirgy uh, Willie Drown in the Yarrow, but we're going to let Chirps do it. Now, the area that we're talking about here with Chirps is not actually his area of Wisconsin. We're going to mostly be talking about his work with Gary Harrison down in the southern Illinois, southern Indiana parts of the Midwest, you know, going to the eastern side of the Midwest coming up here, and uh, that... that that region is where um, Gary Harrison put out that Dear Old Illinois book, which is truly a treasure, a truly a Midwest treasure of tunes. Um, and we're going to hear Chirps talk all about his work with Gary and what he does else. else. Chirps is a, an excellent fiddler, fiddler in his own right, as all the fiddlers are on today. 
All right, so this is Claw Hammer Mike here with our very special guest, Chirp Smith. I was really hoping we could uh, wrangle him into doing this. And with the help of the internet, I think we've done it. So uh, Ch Chirps is now living in LaGrange, Wisconsin, and he goes back a long ways in this Midwest tradition. And he's been in a great bunch of great bands. Most notably, he was in bands with Jerry Harrison, and they collected a lot of this music in the early days. And we have to thank them for a lot of the tunes that are in um, at least the eastern side of the Midwestern uh, connection here. So uh, thanks, Chirps, for being here. And why don't you talk a little bit about how you got started playing fiddle? Way back when, I listened to all kinds of music. And then, of course, in, in college and high school and stuff, I was into rock and roll like many people were. Mm -hmm. And uh, I always found that it, when I heard, like, some earlier performer, you know, like, say, Eric Clapton or somebody says they learned stuff from uh, this old blues guy, you know, and when I heard the old blues guy play, I'd say, oh, that's, that's much more interesting. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and it just kind of continued on that way until I started to listen to some bluegrass and stuff and country music. And then uh, my friend Dan Baird of the Indian Creek Delta Boys, which wasn't yet formed, says, you have to meet these Harrison brothers. They're, they're both really good guitar players. I was trying to play the guitar at the time, doing very well. And so I met up with Gary and Terry Harrison, and later their older brother, Steve Harrison. And uh, I remember I got a hold of uh, the Costa Waltz and the Southern Broadcasters reissue, you know, Tommy Gerald's dad, Ben Gerald, playing fiddle on there. And I thought, wow, that is really something there. I really like that. <laughs> I like yeah, that better yeah. than the bluegrass stuff I've been hearing. And uh, actually, I think one of the first fiddle tunes I learned was the Evening Star Waltz that Ben Gerald played. I forget exactly how we started playing as the Indian Creek Delta Boys, but that was originally me and Gary Harrison and Dan Baird and a fellow named Dave Miller, banjo player. And, you know, we would add and subtract people as like like the bands do today you know <laughs> and, uh, so we steve davis of davis unlimited records he might, must have heard about us when we we went down to uh clarksville tennessee 1970 something delta boys got second place i think in the string band contest there the fiddle contest little competition and so he wanted to record us, and then we made two LPs for Davis Unlimited, which had been reissued on Springfed Records out of Tennessee. Mm -hmm. And uh, Gary's father was a fiddler, and uh, her, his mother played guitar on the radio and everything. And uh, he had some other grand relatives that were fiddlers and stuff too. So we sort of knew that there was fiddle music in the Midwest and Illinois, but as as you probably have noticed, or, well, you, back then it just seemed like uh, everything had everything to do with the mountains and the South. Like that was where all folk music was, in the mountains and the South, and that was it. <laughs> and uh, at that time, you know, then we just thought, well, that's, got a, that's a lot of hooey, you know, because we've seen fiddlers around here. And so we just kind of got interested in the, we were, we played a gig for a friend of ours down in uh, he he was a manager of a little store in a mall in Effingham, Illinois, and he, he wanted us to come down there and play. He was having some event and wanted us to make some noise outside, and uh, we did that. And afterwards, he says, "Well, there's this old fiddler that plays at this bar outside of town. Do you want to go hear him?" And we said, "Yeah, yeah, we do." <laughs> and that, that turned out to be. Uh, Harvey Pappy Taylor, one of our best sources of fiddle music we ever came across, you know. He was a, an old fellow that uh, had always played. He never quit like so many of the older guys did, you know. So he was in good practice, and I think he probably remembered every tune he ever played, it seemed. Mm -hmm. So he we went out to the Midway Tavern outside of Effingham and saw him play, and we arranged to go record him not long after that. And that kind of got us started in the, on the little episodes of going out and recording. And, uh... 
Well, we have to stop chirps at uh, Harvey Pappy Taylor. I mean, come on. Harvey Pappy Taylor was a great, great old fiddler. And I'm so glad that uh, Gary and those folks, they uh, taught him when he was playing. Because I, I, I love this guy's fiddling. So we're going to listen to Pappy Taylor here. Scotland Yard. <laughs> I gotta learn that tune, Scotland Yard. That was that's a cool tune, man. Anyways, we were before we got so rudely interrupted by me. We were talking to Chirp Smith, and we were beginning to start to focus in on a tune here. So let's go back to Chirps and hear his words. Of course, Gary Harrison, you know, really did the lion's share of it, and the others, the rest of us, just kind of helped from time to time, went along on trips. Or Steve Harrison one time went around through Southern Illinois. That was when we. We found Joe Wingener and recorded him, even though he said he didn't play fiddle anymore. <laughs> he lied. We showed him a fiddle and said, Jerry, could you take a look at this fiddle? You know, any good fiddler is going to look at a fiddle and have, just have to try it out, you know. <laughs> good trick. Yeah, that was, it worked. And the first tune he played was the one that we recorded that we called Joe Wingener's tune, which a lot of people like to play nowadays. That was pretty interesting. <laughs> Good find. And, uh, he also, he was a source of uh, another tune that I recorded on a cassette recording, Prairie Dog, many, many years ago. And that one, I, when I learned it, you know, I didn't know who it was from or anything. Uh, Gary would take these tapes and he would extract the tunes and just kind of re-record them onto another tape. And, and so for a while he was announcing what who it was and what the name of the tune was but after a while he just did the tunes and he would give me copies of these tapes and I'd have like a whole 60 minute cassette tape with 100 tunes on it with no identification at all like who they were, where they came from or... Hey that sounds like the upper Midwest there <laughs> yeah, you, yeah sure you betcha Yeah <laughs> and, uh, so I would learn tunes off of there, and I really didn't have any idea what they were called or who they were from. So I eventually found out that that tune was from Joe Wingeter's, and he and he had called it. He just said it was an old song tune, so I just call it Joe Wingeter's old song tune. That's a go. fun one too. But uh, so that that kind of really you know, got us going, collecting music, and, and like I say, Gary did most of it. He was, he was much more well versed in the in the in the music and the traditions and really great guitar player for those that wanted seconds and, uh, and a really good fiddle player and then I had the ability to to just hear the like the scratchiest old fiddler bumbling around on the fiddle and you could figure out what they were doing you know <laughs> well if you've seen the book 
dear old Illinois, that would give you a good idea. It's, you know, I think Massive. there's at least a, a hundred or more fiddlers in there that he interviewed and recorded. Had to, had to be so much time he spent into doing that. Oh, yeah. Well, he was working on that book for a decade. Great book. Such a great resource. I wish more folks used it. It doesn't seem like enough folks get get their tunes from from there. You know, there's such great tunes in there that you just, well, you probably hear them all the time, but I don't mm -hmm. ever hear them. So, you know, I was, I was playing some out of there the other night, and they're just such great tunes. Well, there's a lot of, a lot of great tunes in there and, and good songs, too, because uh -huh. Gary was working at the Indiana University, you know, in the in the archives, he became a really outstanding conservator. The professor from Southern Illinois University, David McIntosh, had been kind of sending his students out and about in Southern Illinois to record songs and stuff from from their people they knew, usually relatives, you know, grandpa or somebody, you know. So he got some good recordings that way too, the, you know, from people that we never got to meet. The, uh, at Battleground, we met up with uh, you know later, and we met up with uh, Lotus Dickey. Yeah. So he was he was a very influential fiddler too, and Paul Tyler put out the nice recordings of him that you probably have heard, mm -hmm. and he knows, you know, it's him being a, a professional doctor of folklore, you know. Mm -hmm. He, he knows how to research perhaps better than I do, you know. And, uh, so he was finding a lot of uh, Indiana music. So once I got married and moved to Chicago in 1978, or thereabouts, I met up with Mark Gunther. It was another big fiddling influence on me. I'd say the, the two biggest fiddling influences on me are Gary Harrison and Mark Gunther. 1984 or five. Right about that time, Dot was saying, oh, you should play music with Steve Rosen. And so we started playing music with Steve Rosen in, in that configuration with Steve Rosen on banjo and John Turr on guitar, and me and Fred on fiddles and Mo Nelson on bass. And we played a gig in 85 down at Clayville, Illinois. I guess that'd probably be the very first Volo gig. And the, and the Volos are still at it today. Right. Sports periodically <laughs> sporadically <laughs> a mighty fine band volo bontrotters that's for darn sure yeah, that, was, that was the band where i where i really just became a fiddler <laughs> so what tune do you want to zero in on today that uh that that would be of significance to you in the middle in the midwest tradition i don't know the one tune that always made an impression on on me was one that we got from jesse james abbott down in uh, cumberland county near outside of the little town of Toledo. Interesting old fellow, played a lot. He played kind of a mix between tunes that sounded sort of, you know, Northern and some that sounded like Southern, you know, like <laughs> he uh, played this tune called The Rush and the Pepper, which I'm sure you probably play. Great tune. And, and that, that, that tune was like snatched from oblivion by us, you know, because we'd never we never heard anybody else play that tune ever anywhere, <laughs> not on old recordings, not anywhere from any other fiddlers in the area or in Illinois or anywhere else. It was just that one guy playing that tune. And then we recorded it and then other people started playing it. And then now it's all over the place. You know, people have trouble with the title and we have no idea what it means. The Rush and The Pepper. Yeah. <laughs> And so then the final question is, uh, what what do you want to promote today? Do you have any websites or CDs or anything that you want to promote about yourself right now? But uh, the thing I would like to promote, two things. This this group, Chroma. I don't oh, know if you Chroma. can see that. This is uh, my hat for the Colorado Old Time Music Festival, Rocky Mountain Old Time Music Festival. That's a great festival. I love it. And the Indiana Fiddlers Gathering, I love that place. I've gone to almost every, uh, this year would have been the 48th year. And I think I've been to at least 44 of them. Nice job. Three, Gee, three of them. a lot. <laughs> now, the Indian Creek Delta Boys used to play over there all the time. But, uh, that, that's a near and dear to my heart. And then the other thing that's near and dear to my heart is the uh, 
Montana Fiddle Camp. Oh. I love the Montana Fiddle Camp. Two weeks of instruction out there, you know, two one-week sessions. and They always have some of the finest musicians, a lot of musicians that people have not really heard of very much, a lot of Western fiddlers. And Thanks for being with us today and talking about all things uh, Midwest fiddle. And uh, you're definitely a legend in the field, and I, and I want to thank you for doing this interview. I thank you. I'm just uh, going about teaching tunes, and uh, I'm uh, promoting the original cloud storage of putting all these tunes in other people's heads. All right, here's the rush and the pepper that I was talking about earlier. Uh, it comes from a fellow named Jesse James Abbott, who lived around Toledo, Illinois, which is in Cumberland County. Uh, he was born in 1893 and died in 1978. That's the show, everybody. It was big fun. Thanks, everybody, who stayed from the first note to the last note. Um, I didn't. I wanted to do a thorough job, you know. I wanted to make sure uh, we could get as much in here as we could, you know. I thought about cutting everything down, but no. I just I wanted to let it let it roll so that people could really get a history lesson plus just a musical party. And I felt like that's that's what we did tonight, and I felt like it worked well. So if you want to support the show, this was probably about, oh, 60 to 80 hours of work that I put in. You can go to PayPal, unarmedjournalhotmail.com, Venmail, at Clawhammer Mike, and, you know, throw five bucks my way. But, you know, if not, just, just take it freely for the love of the music. And uh, we'll see you all but probably back to Upper Midwest old time next week. But it's been great visiting with all these old timers in the midwest they are some great musicians and uh it's just been real real joy to do see y'all later <laughs>